would, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 51. 51. I'm going to use the podium mic. I wasn't quite, quite ready this evening. I came in late during worship. Um, and just another prayer request. Um, you guys know Jason and Kelly Schween. His dad passed away earlier, suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, earlier today. So just keep their family in prayer. And uh, they're just kind of, especially Jason, if you would, just kind of hard on him. So but, but we'll, let's, before we start, let's pray really quick. We'll, we'll ask God to be there. So, Lord, we just do, we pray for Jason, Lord. We pray for his mom and for Kelly and for Ryan, Lord. Lord, just pray for comfort in their lives, God. Lord, we thank you that you, you hold our lives in your hand, Lord, that you see from beginning to end, Lord God. And Lord, we just trust you with um, just our lives and with them, and we ask that you would meet them right where they're at. And uh, just bring your love, God. We just thank you. We praise you that we can call on you. We thank you that you're there in the hard things, Lord. And we just ask that you'd... Show yourself strong, God, in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Whoa. Whoa, man, I opened my eyes and it was dark in here. All right. We got some good lighting effects going on. Isaiah chapter 51. Now, last week we went through the first six verses, but in probably true Isaac fashion, we're going to back up to the beginning, go through it again, take a running start. Um... And I just wanted to bring us back to the reminder. I mentioned this last week, but just the reminder of we got an interesting kind of format um, in these chapters. In chapter 51 and in 52, we have these two sets of three, really they're calls from God to listen, you know? And so that in itself is significant, you know, that God would say, hey, listen, uh, I want you to hear this. And he would repeat himself every time. So it should bring us to a place where we're, we're leaning forward in to listen to what God would have to say. And we always should be, but even more when he's going, listen, right? So in chapter 51, verse 1 says, listen to me. Verse 4 says, listen to me. And then down in verse 7, it says, listen to me. So we got these three different things that God is calling out to the children of Israel, of course, to us who are God's kids to listen. And then we see in verse 9 of 51, awake, awake. So he's calling the same kind of thing. He's calling, wake up, listen. He says all the way down in verse 17, again, awake, awake. And then in chapter 52, verse 1, awake, awake for the kind of the final little section. And we're going to try to hit through all of this um, tonight, there was another interesting one I looked at. Last week, I mentioned that there was another um, couple of areas where he says, and it's one of them's at the end of verse 6, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. Really just reminding Israel and us tonight of the power of God's salvation and of the power of his righteousness. But then he also has the same thing at the end of verse 8. He says, but my righteousness will be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. And I thought that was the only two, but as I was looking at it again, reading over today, there's a third one and we missed it. It's at the beginning. It's in verse five uh, there. It says, my righteousness is near and my salvation has gone forth. The first time he mentions it. So the first time he just says this fact about his righteousness in the verse six, he says, but these things happen. But God is one of the good buts in the Bible, but God, and then the end of verse 8, but God again, but my righteousness. So anyway, just some patterns we see in the writing here. Um, but that's where we're at. So let's just really quick, I'm going to give you the overview of these first three um, listens that we're going we're gonna to look at. In verse 1 there, the, the overview is going to be God's calling them to look really where God brought them from, to remember. And, and remember, the theme sort of is in light of Babylon, they're not in captivity right now, 
God's talking about it like it's already happened because he sees they're going into captivity. He knows they're going, he's already told them they're going to be going into captivity. He's already told them they're going to be delivered by Cyrus, that he's going to have his hand in that as he's, uh, as they're released. But at this point, he's saying, when you go through these difficult times, remember back to where you came from. Remember the blessing of God. Remember what he's called you out of. He says, he's going to say there in verse 4, he's going to call them to listen and then remind them of the future. That their future with God is bright. When you're going through a difficult thing and it just seems dark, it's always good to look forward to the future and the hope that we have. And I, I think in my, in my mind, I go, especially nowadays, goodness gracious, I look around at the world and go, man, it's going nuts. It's going crazy. It's going to Rumsey Park. <laughs> you know, you just, you, you listen, you think about the stuff that's going on. And you're going, man, that's, it, it, it is crazy. And it does seem dark and it does seem bleak. And it does seem like right now the, the enemy's got, the evil has power. But the truth is, it's like that song we sang. The truth is, number one, our battle's not against flesh and blood. But it's against the powers and principalities. It's spiritual. And then that song we sang, how do we fight our battles? Well, as believers, we fight our battles on our knees. We fight our battles in praise. When the enemy's attacking us, to just praise him. Turn some praise music on and sing some of that good old stuff that we heard tonight. It brought me back to my childhood, man. <laughs> Seventh grader with the big old bass standing up there playing that worship stuff. Awesome. So, but but to do those things and our our weapons, the weapons of our warfare, guys, remember this: they're mighty in pulling down strongholds, but they're not flesh. They're not getting mad in the flesh. You know, they're not throwing rocks. They're throwing those prayer grenades, if you will. Those prayer, uh, just the 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 way that we fight is so different. And I, anyways, I'm kind of talking a little bit about something else that's going on, but. I just, there's, there, there's really, I mean, the most powerful things we have in our arsenal are the word of God and the gospel and prayer. They really are. And so either we believe that or we don't. Um, verse, in verse 9, God, the last listen that he says is to not lose heart and to not grow weary at the reproach or the persecution of man. So that's what the three are going to be. Um, so just kind of try to keep those in mind as we go through and let's check it out. These words of comfort, it says at the beginning, the title of my chapter, the Lord comfort Zion. So let's check it out. Verse one, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit, which you have, from which you were dug, look to Abraham, your father and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So first we have right there in verse 1. And I just want to slow down and take a look at this, this call to listen that he says here. This call to listen, and, and specifically, who's he calling to, to listen? He's calling to those who follow after righteousness and those who seek the Lord. It's funny because I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, automatically we church people go, oh, that's me. And we don't really give it much further thought. We just go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm one of those guys that's following after righteousness and that's seeking the Lord. And it's easy for us to give ourselves a very big benefit of the doubt. That's just me. I know it's me because I'm always the good guy in the Bible. Uh, that's not quite true, right? I mean, I think about my life ago. I'm not always the good guy in the Bible. I'm the guy that needs the rebuke and the kick in the pants and the, hey, straighten up and let's follow after the Lord. Let's not be a hypocrite. All these things in life. But it's a call and, and it's easy for us to, to just put ourselves in that boat. But I challenge us this evening to really stop and say to yourself, look that guy in the mirror and say, prove it. Show me. 
What is your life? Is it different? You know, I heard a, I heard a guy that was talking about, I think it was Greg Laurie. I don't remember. It was, there's so many little reels that play on in my head. But he was talking about if, if persecution got to the place where you could be charged for being a Christian, and the challenge was this, is there enough evidence in your life that you're a Christian to be charged with being a Christian? It's something good to stop and think about. You know, would you get charged for praying in Walmart? You can't pray in Walmart? What, are you kidding me? No, God's in Walmart. I can pray in Walmart, right? <laughs> this, we're still, we still have freedoms. We still have rights in this country to follow Jesus, to put our faith in him, uh, to, be the, to be the light in the darkness. But just to think about it and just to challenge ourselves why should I believe that I am following after righteousness? Why should I believe? And really the evidence would be if we're following after the word of God and we're, we're, we're listening to and being led by the spirit of God. So what's the word that he says to those that are seeking the Lord? That we, that, that, <clears throat> that we I'm sorry, that would be an encouragement to us. The, the word is really, it's a call to look at our lives and remember where God has brought us from. And he says a couple of things, it just the first sentence, and it's just a sentence that stops, and then he says something else. So it's the last half of verse 1, and he says there, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and he says, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Can any of you guys look back to your life before Jesus and say, I was in a pit, I was in a hole, and he pulled me out. He pulled me out of the mess, and guess what? <laughs> I dug the pit. <laughs> I, I went into it willingly with the shovel and made it deeper, made my hole deeper, made my mess worse. I put myself in that place, and he pulled me out. And if you have that testimony, praise God. Allow that to be a part of your witnessing, a part of what you share with people. Man, I made a mess out of my life, and God pulled me out, and, and he's brought blessing into my life. He's brought stability into my life. He's changed me from that always making the mess into someone who still makes messes, but now I'm standing on a different foundation. I'm not in the pit anymore. I'm hewn from the rock. And when I think of that, when I think of that, that word that he says, hewn from the rock, I think to myself, that is the rock of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. Now my foundation is actually on the rock. I used to be in the pit. Now I'm on the rock. And I, I just, it, it, hopefully all of us can go, man, we are grateful for that. I was talking to a guy just the other day and he was talking about his past. And he says, you know, I used to look at my past as fond memories. And now I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm not there anymore. And I just have to say a big hearty amen to that. I'm so thankful. That's not the glory days. That's the, that's the emptiness, that's the hollowness, that's the me trying to get filled in the world, and it never works. It does not work. Either way, both of these things that God does in our lives, his strength and his salvation, for me, that has been the case. And in verse 2, he reiterates with a supernatural story for them to remember. He says, Remember that God used one man and one woman to start your whole family. That's what he's telling Israel. He was one man and one woman. And you know, in my mind, I would think a young, healthy, 30-year-old couple. But that's not who God used. God used Abraham and Sarah. And they started out old. In fact, Sarah started out what, what, what is known as past the flower of her youth, which means she couldn't have kids when God called them to go start the nation. And so God's just saying, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that where I started you from, when I came and started the nation of Israel, called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of paganism, which there's a whole other thing. You started in paganism and in idolatry. And I called you out of that. And then I called you at an age where there was no fertility. And also Abraham was very old past the flower of his youth. But it was God who allowed them. And remember, they even tried in their own strength. They said, God, 
We need to give you a little bit of help here. This isn't going to work. Let me tell you about the birds and the bees. And God says, it doesn't matter about the birds and the bees when it's God. And so they tried to help God, and that made a big mess. And God said, that's not what I want to do. I want to bring a seed from you. And that's what he did. Supernaturally, he allowed Isaac to be born. Supernaturally. And he, and he allowed that small, humble beginning in that very old, old age to start the nation of Israel. And so he's saying, look back at where God has brought you from, out of the pit, supernaturally. And I don't know about you guys. I hope that that's a part of your testimony. When you look back, you say, God was the one that called me. It wasn't that I went off on this mission to find God. I, God called me, and he kept drawing me. And I came, and he's put my life on the rock, and I can look back and say, man, there's been supernatural goodness of God in my life. And I hope that's your testimony. It's, it's the truth of God for us. And so if it's not, man, pray that that will be. I mean, seek the Lord and say, God, I still need change. I still want you in my life. His, and let me just remind you of this. When we look back at Abraham and what God did, I want to remind you of something. God's calling and his blessing on your life are literally the best thing we can do with our life. The absolute best thing we can do is not to build our own self or our own kingdom or our own life, but to allow God in, to ask him in. Invite him to say, God, what do you want me to do? Because when God leads, when God is the one that allows us or calls us into a place of life where we're doing what he's asked, it, is, it fulfills our purpose. It is the best. Then he says in verse 3, or in verse 3, he reminds them of his comfort, of the hope of their future, that God is good, the God of comfort. The God of joy, the God of gladness, the God who brings thanksgiving and singing. And that's what he describes himself as in verse 3. He says, for the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. All of the places that you don't like, God will comfort those. He'll make her wilderness, her desert, like the Garden of Eden. And her desert like the Garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. And so he's talking really... There's the, the far fulfillment of this, which is the millennial reign when Israel, everything will just be amazing. And it already is pretty cool, except they have a lot of enemies. They still have a whole lot of enemies, but the land is really fruitful. It's not, it still has deserts, still has wildernesses, but also you have to understand that this would have been music to their ears while they were in captivity going, man, God's going to bring us out of here. He's going to bring us back into the land. So now we go to verse 4, the second listen to me. And God says in verse 4, Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. So the, the theme is in this section is now looking to the future and looking to God's reign. And, and we, looked, we talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about that this earth is temporary, right? I, I mentioned that he's saying the universe and the earth, which, by the way, I think human, humans would look at and say, that's the most permanent thing we know. Really, it's, a, it's it. The whole of the universe? I mean, it, <laughs> it's the thought that it's always been there. And the earth is temporary as well. It's funny, as when I was reading that, I thought to myself, I was kind of overhearing a conversation that Pete was having at our fellowship in the park where he was talking about how they, I think they just recently discovered that the earth was older than it used to be, <laughs> some, some billions of years. And so I think back to what Chuck Smith used to say, in my lifetime, the earth has become like whatever it is, 30 billion years older than when I was a kid. So basically, I age very well. 
right? <laughs> I mean, it's just the whole thing. And when they come to something they can't figure out scientifically, they go, it's just got to be older. You know, I remember, I remember having that, it was when a, a guy came to share about the Grand Canyon, the layers in the Grand Canyon, he did a lot of rafting tours, and I can't remember his name, but he came and he shared, and I thought, I, basically, I have the golden question. Like, how do they deal with this stuff that you're talking about? How do they deal with it scientifically? He just says, well, they just throw another billion years at it. I go, well, if it doesn't work and it looks like God created it, we can just say, well, it took even billions and billions more years, and then they just throw anything, any logic out the window. Anyways, God says something the opposite here. He says, the earth and the universe is temporary. And I said this last time. I kind of like how it came out. The earth has an expiration date. And also, all life has an expiration date. Something for us to remember. Ten out of every ten people alive today will die. It's the fact of life. One out of one, ten out of ten, a hundred out of a hundred, everyone has an expiration date. And that's something important to think about. It's something important when it, when it comes up, when death, when we're faced with death in our life, to think hopefully us, to stop and think, Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in our future. Our future is not, this is not our home. Man, that helps a lot with the whole, all of life. Remember, this is not a home. This is like the tent. And you guys know how it is to sleep in a tent. It gets old quick. This is not my permanent place. <laughs> Praise God. We're, we have a bright future and a destiny. Okay, so this whole um, life is temporary and there's some interesting things that he says here. He also says that those who dwell in it will die in like manner. So he just says life is temporary. And he seems to be saying here in this section of scripture that those who die without the Lord, that's all they have. But, and that's a, the, one of those amazing ones at the end of verse 6, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. And if that doesn't point to the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament, I don't know what does. Actually, I do. Chapter 53, which I'm setting it up. I'm throwing a lob to Michael. He's going to get the pinnacle of the Old Testament, the chapter, the mountaintop, Jesus revealed to us 700 years before he came. Is that right? Seven, I think it is. Okay. He'll tell you next time. Next week, he'll tell you the exact time. Right? Yeah, okay, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm joking around a little bit. It's because I'm wearing my preaching slippers from Hawaii. I don't know why I thought about that. Let me, okay, here's a rabbit trail. Let me just go on this rabbit trail for a second. I remember when I was a kid, was, I was younger, I wasn't a kid, but I was younger, and we had this pastor that on Sunday mornings would wear a t-shirt, like a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops, and I always thought, you can't wear flip-flops when you teach, and then I just realized I'm wearing flip-flops tonight because I wasn't quite ready, but... That's okay. In Hawaii, they're called slippers. They're my preaching slippers. All right. Get that out of the way. All right. So what we have here, when I, when, when I, when I look at this, and we're kind of back, backing up a little bit here. In this, there is truth at the beginning of this section. Back to verse Four, when he, when he talks about the law proceeding from him and that he would make his justice rest as a light of the people. So when I look at this, I look at his law and his justice being a light, his righteousness being a light. And I think of Psalm 119, verse 105, which says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And that's the truth. It's something that enlightens us. It's something that enlightens us to the world and to the path that we should be on in life, to be in his word. To use it as that, to think about the situations that come up in life and say, God, what does your word say about this? Because I want to honor you. I want you to be the lead in my life. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. I'm just going to throw this out here because I can't read this verse without thinking about it. And what does a lamp do? Does a lamp show a spotlight all the way to the end of the path that you're on? No, it lights the, the, the next few steps that you're going to take. And this is how God works so often in our life. We, we just He's with us step at a time. 
And we're in his word. We let his word lead us and guide us every step in life. So I don't know where you're at here. I'm thinking of some of the young people here that maybe have things on their future that they, they got to take a step in there. It's an unknown. It's like, I don't know. I got to get a job now or do I got to go out and they got, do I got to live on my own? Do I have the things that come up in life? I just encourage you and challenge you to let God's word direct your steps. Let them direct. Don't let Instagram direct your steps or Facebook direct your steps. Let God's word direct your next steps. Don't let somebody else. There's all the voices nowadays and usually they're right here. Man, sometimes I just want to grab my kids. Hello. Hello, I'm here. Life is happening all around you. You're missing it with your face in that thing. And then sometimes my wife does the same thing. Hello, I'm here. Where are you? I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Okay, next thing. Final lesson to me. Once again, uh, to the people who know righteousness, in verse 7, right? It's the, the final, listen to me. It's, and it's against to the people that know righteousness. And he says something different. The people that know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. In whose heart is my law. Real quick, how do you get God's law into your heart? You know, I, you know who I think of? Any of you guys watch Garfield? I mean, didn't he just, this is, this is the thing, right? When he would put books on his head and in the book. So how do we get God's law into our heart? It's not like that. It's not like Garfield. We have to read the Bible, guys. We have to actually take the Bible. We have to read the Bible. We have to Im implant God's word into our heart. We need that. You know, I think about um, my devotion this morning. I'm going to turn to it. It was Proverbs. I think it was chapter 4 or 5. I read 3 or 4 of them this morning. But as I was reading through this, I thought to myself, man, this is so, this is such amazing wisdom. Well, Proverbs chapter 3 was a few days ago when some unexpected news came uh, into our lives. And I'll just, it doesn't really matter because it's kind of neither here nor there, but I'll just let you guys know. Uh, we were talking to some realtors, and the guy next door at the land said, hey, why don't you make us an offer? And so we made an offer, and his expectation was, <laughs> I think he thinks that there's unobtainium in the ground over there, because <laughs> basically <laughs> something, I don't know what, it, gold, it's just something. But anyways, there's not any over there, as far as we know. And so we said, okay, God shut the door. We were asking him to shut the door. He did it. We said, open the door, shut the door. And so this is the, the verse in my devotion that day. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And all I had to do was go, thank you, Lord. You're directing my path because I'm acknowledging you in my life. Where else do we get this kind of stuff? And how do we implant that into our hearts if we don't read the Bible? And I'm challenging us, read the Word of God. It's a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And you know what? That convicted me too. Because I had to step, take a step back and look at the very beginning of verse 5 and say, God, am I trusting you with all my heart? Because when I do trust, with, trust in you with all my heart, all of the what-ifs and the worries, I can let them go. And say, I trust in God the one who owns the unobtainium on a thousand hills. <laughs> you guys know what unobtainium, unobtainium is? Unobtainium is from the movie Avatar, and they would go mine the planet, and they'd get this stuff that was worth bajillions of dollars. Yeah. Don't watch the movie. Just, it's just a thing. There's too many blue people with no clothes on. So, okay, let me just see it. Let me see if I can find the other one. I got I to gotta look for this other verse. And I'm sorry to do this, but this is just, I'm not sorry to do this. Because it's so, so good when we are in the Word of God. And here it is. This was my devotion, I think it was yesterday. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. 
It's such an important word. Guys, listen, serious, listen up. This is so important. This wisdom of Solomon. He says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. It's a word from Proverbs to tell us, listen, this is what the world tells you today. Follow your heart. God is saying, no, guard your heart. Keep your heart from all of that wickedness in the world. Guard it. Protect it because out of it flows the issues of life. And I'm just saying, without implanting God's word in our lives or in my life, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be thinking of those things. I wouldn't have those things on my heart, on my mind. We have to read God's word to input his, his law into our lives. It's so important. I think of Proverbs 4.23. Oh, I just read that. I'm sorry. That was from my devotion. That was the other one. But that's trust in the Lord. So let's keep going. Listen to me. He says in verse 7, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the, mouth, for the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. So the last, the last exhortation of the listens to me is, don't be afraid of people. You know, and, and that's for a few different things in life. Number one, don't be afraid of what people say when you share the gospel and the truth of the word. If they're, if they're rejected, if they have that hard heart towards God, that's between them and God. You did your job of planting the seed, of giving them the scripture, giving them the gospel. That's, that's the, the important part. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, 28, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So Jesus specifically says who we should have a fear of is God. We should have a respect, a fear for God. We shouldn't be, you know, scared of um, or fear man. Don't be afraid. And, and you know what happens when we get into the fear of man? And we do. We're, I think we all get guilty of getting into the fear of man. We work at a job. We think, I can't share the gospel or something because my boss or whatever or these people might give a bad report. There's always, or even just sharing the gospel to someone. You ever go into someone and you think, I'm going to share the gospel. And then you get in there and it's like you got a apple in your neck or throat or however you want to, whatever you want to say. You can't, it's just you get cold feet. I want to give you another verse, Proverbs 29, verse 25, and it says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And so we get this thought of the temporary nature of life and the person who doesn't know righteousness and whose law is not in their heart. And God is showing us there's nothing to fear in the scope of God and in the scope of eternity. But man, again, verse 8 shows the brevity of life, and he's talking about those guys that are mocking at the Lord, that don't accept God. He says the moth will eat them like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. And, that, and I don't know, for some reason, that brings my mind to a time when we were out going door-to-door -door witnessing, and I was talking to this guy and he came out and he goes, oh, that's all garbage. Everything you believe, you know, which immediately you're just like, you're, your mind always, ah. you go, what? Garbage? I'll take you out with the garbage. You're always like, what are you talking about? And it's just their, it's just their defense mechanism. Because remember what we learned on Sunday, the problem isn't that he thinks he's so smart and he has it all figured out. The problem is that he has a love of darkness. He has sin in his life and he doesn't want to surrender to God. He doesn't want to yield his life to God. So Jesus shows us the problem. But um, when, I, when I look at this, when I, when I think about what the guy said to me and what this verse says, he said, no, no, that's a bunch of garbage. We're all just worm dirt, basically what he said. Well, that's all we are. When we die, we just become worm dirt. The crazy thing is, is that God is saying that about people that die apart from being born again and having a second life. He's saying, th and really this is what it, it boils down to because they do have an eternal soul. But their destiny, like Jesus said in Matthew, is a whole other destiny than ours. And so it's that, it's that whole idea again of 
if you if you if you are how does, let's see if I can remember this if I can, see if I can articulate this if you're born twice you die once but if you're born once you die twice I said it last week right and I think of that song Chris Christopherson song you guys remember that one no wait a minute is that the right one no it's not the right one Chris Christopherson had another really good song why me Lord the uh, one I'm thinking of is one that my uncle used to sing with my mom and it was, I don't know who wrote it, but it was kind of the same style of song. But it was talking about being born again, being born twice. Yeah, Grandpa's singing it. Born twice, wants to live, wants to die, wants to enter this world but not to stay, wants to wash me and carry my sins away, right? It's good stuff. So, go, yep, that's the old stuff back in the day. All right. But this all is relevant and not for the old stuff. It's good stuff, new stuff. So now, okay, let's get to the awakens. We've got to get through the next chapter and a half in five minutes. So <laughs> let's check it out. Verse 9. He says, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Are you not the one who dried up the seas, the waters of the great deep that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing with everlasting joy on their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and singing and shall flee away. So what we have here is this first awake, awake. If you notice there, it's not God to man, it's man to God. So it's man in a place of desperation. And really, the children of Israel, fast forward into Babylon, are calling out to God, I need you to save me. Put on strength, God. Arm of the Lord, which is the right hand. It's the arm of the Lord is the strength of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. And then he goes into this verses 10 and 11, which are just an, an amazing depiction of the Exodus, specifically in the Red Sea. And I like this section of um, th this section of Scripture recalling the Exodus because it really flies in the face of that kind of secular theory about it being the Reed Sea, you know, where the children of Israel, they, well, they crossed over, it was two feet deep where they crossed. And so that's how come they were able to have an exodus because the water was two feet deep. And then, of course, you get the scholars that go, well, then there's even a greater miracle because he drowned the whole army of Pharaoh in two feet of water <laughs> and all their horses. Doesn't make sense. But what we do see here, though, in verse 10 is it says that they, he made a road. He made the depths of the sea a road. And he calls it the deep. That he dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, and made a road for them to cross for the ones that he redeemed, that he bought from the slave block of Egypt to cross over. And that he ransomed them. And that they came in. Look at how they came in. Man, could, I guarantee you. At first, I'd probably be trembling and tripping out on how the provision that he made. But then they came in with singing. They were just joyful. They're full of gladness. Their sorrow and sighing fell away. Absolutely awesome. Okay, let's keep going on. Verse uh, 12. I, he says, even I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? And of the son of man who will be made like grass, which will wither quickly, right? Verse 13, and you forget the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor when he has prepared to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, that he should not die in the pit and that his bread should not fail. But I am the Lord your God who divided the sea, whose waves roared. Again, verse 15, this is the depiction of them crossing the Red Sea. Divided the sea, the waves were roaring. 
The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. So God, Isaiah, God's using Isaiah to remind the nation of Israel, again, not to be afraid of man, not to fear what the oppressor would do, but to trust in the Lord. He's, you're afraid of him? Did he stretch out the heavens? Did he make the earth, the foundations of the earth? He did not. He did not. His strength will fail. Mine never will. I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one that made a way before. And I love, I do love this reference. It reminds me of that song, that song uh, from Elevation Worship. It says, I'm going to do it again, right? We'll see you do it again. Where it's talking about the things that he did in the past. And that's really what he's telling them. You remember what I did. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to deliver my people again. And he, he does. But we need to not fear man. We need to continue to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. And it's so important. And I, I don't want to, I know that we all of us here are human people. And I know that we all have doubts. We all have fears. But man, the Lord's been showing to me over and over, trust in me. Like, don't just think about trusting in me. Give me those things. Trust that I am this God. That I have made the way before. You know, stop with the, I, just for me, stop with the running it over in your mind and worrying again and again. That is, that's not trusting. Lay it down. Bring it before me. Believe that I am who I am. Be still and know that I'm God. Know that my word for you is true and that I do have a plan for you, a hope and a future. You know, and then every once in a while, God will use some outside source and he'll speak to your life. And he'll remind you that you have that plan, that you have that same God and that same amazing future. And thank you for that too, Lord. Amen. All right, let's see. Let's, yeah, we're almost done. So we'll wrap up this last awake and I'm going to have to leave all of chapter 52, which is great. The end of chapter 52 bleeds right into chapter 53. So however you hit that, Michael, it's going to be great, I'm sure. So here we go. Verse 17, God's fury removed. It says, awake, awake. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. There is no one to guide her among all the sons she has brought forth. There's, nor is there any who take her by the hand among all the sons, sons that she brought up. These two things have come to you. Number one, who will be sorry for you? Desolation, destruction, famine, and sword. And number two, by whom will I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets like an antelope in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, and drunk but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord and your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you and have laid your body like the ground and as streets for those who walk over. So he closes this section with the last awake and the, 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 the thing that he's really speaking of in this. He's speaking that the judgment is over, basically. He's telling them, now this judgment 
is come. You've drank the judgment of the Lord. And this is, a, this is a, um, an idea that's being presented here in verse 17. And he also brings it up again at the end uh, in verse 22 there. But it's an idea that's a biblical idea that the wrath of the Lord is depicted as this cup of judgment. So God's revealing. He's allowed this judgment called captivity, taken captive to Babylon in their lives to bring them to a place. And really, he's also not only just allowed that, but he said, and there's no one to help you. Who's going to help you? All the kids you brought up, they're not doing any good. In fact, one of the commentaries I went through said um, in verse 20, it's actually talking about your kids are partying. They're drunk. That your sons have fainted because of alcohol out in the street and they lie at the head of the street like an antelope in a net kind of flopping around trying to get up and they can't and so he's saying they're drinking in the fury of the lord this judgment's coming upon everybody the young people can't even help nobody can help the people that should be able to help aren't there to help and so god's saying and i'm allowing you to drink this to the fullest but then, if you see there, he also puts an end to it. Verses 21 through 23, he says there's a measured judgment, and then it's over. Interesting, though, when we think about this cup of the wrath of the Lord, there's a few other places that we see it prominently. The main one, and the, probably the absolute most important one, is in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus goes and he, and he prays and he cries out that if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. The, the same cup, the cup of the judgment of God for what? For my sin that he knew was coming that was going to cause separation from the Father. And here's the biblical truth. Jesus drank the fullness of the wrath, the cup of the wrath of God for my sin. So that I could have right standing with the Father. Talk about not fair. People go, Christianity is not fair. I'm like, you're right. It's not fair. Jesus took everything. So that all I had to do is back to Sunday, John 3, 16. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. But why? Because he so loved the world. Christianity, what Jesus did at the cross is so far above and beyond fair. There's a song that I used to remember. My, my brother shared it with me. It's kind of a weird punk ska, whatever they called it back in the day. But there was a line in there that I just absolutely loved talking about Jesus and the cross. And the line says, and when it came to do or die, he died for me. When it came to that point, he, he said, your will be done, not my will. If there's any other way, take this cup, but not my will, yours be done. And there was no answer from heaven. What happened in the garden was he sent angels, God sent angels to minister to him so that he could go through what had to be done for our sin. Because there would, there's no, apart from Christ and what he did that, that night and the next day on the cross, there is no propitiation for sin. There is no atonement. There is no cleansing for, for the sin of the world apart from the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross. And so for me to say later, God, is to say no now. Or for me to say, eh, when I get really old, then I'll accept you. You can say that. But I just got a call an hour before I came in. And the call reminded me of something. There's a lot of promises in the Bible, but you being alive tomorrow is not one of them. And it's so important for us to accept that gift while it's called today. It's so important for us to not let that blood and that sacrifice be spent in vain. And, it, and it's not. Praise God. The other place that the judgment is mentioned is in Revelation when it talks about the wrath that will be poured out on the people specifically that take the mark of the beast and that worship the beast. There's going to be a whole other bunch of wrath poured out in the cup 
Um, and that's in Revelation, well, it's in a few places, chapter 14 and chapter 16, and I think there's one other place that you can look that up. I guess all that to say tonight, we'll wrap it up, we'll close up tonight, but I think we just need to stop for a second and thank Jesus for drinking the fullness of that cup. Thank Jesus, like we looked at back at the beginning of this chapter, for pulling us out of the pit that we dug, that pit of sin that separated us from God. So let's all stand and we'll close in prayer. And God, we thank you tonight for that precious blood. Lord, we thank you tonight for that offering that you gave, Lord, that sacrifice that you became, that you became sin who knew no sin so that we could be come, so that we could have the righteousness of God. Again, not a fair trade, but we're so thankful for it, Lord. We're so thankful for that rightness that you've given us. So God, I thank you. I praise you for your word tonight, Lord. I pray you bless your people as we go out, God. Just strengthen us, encourage us. Lord, get, remind us of those words. And I pray that this church, Lord, that this little body of believers would be a people who have your word hidden in their heart because they read it, Lord. They want to hear what you have to say. They want to know. They want to allow uh, your word to to guard our hearts, Lord, to keep us, Lord, so that when the things come in this life, and they will, we have your foundation under our feet, Lord God. So we thank you, and I praise you. Lord, we just ask you to bless us. And one more time, God, just praying for those praise or those prayer requests, Lord. I, I came in kind of halfway through what Shannon was asking, Lord. We pray for that situation, God. We pray for Tammy, Lord, and the surgery tomorrow. And Lord, we pray for the Schween family, God, as they go through this, this first sort of empty night, Lord, that's difficult without this life and, and uh, this loved one in their, in their home, Lord, in their heart. So we just ask that you would comfort and be with them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, hold on, one more prayer. Lord, we pray for Isaac, too, Lord, as he's going to be leaving, God. We just ask that you'd be with him. Go, go before him, Lord. Encourage him to walk after you, stay close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.